Managing Your Emotions Chapter 10 Restoring the Inner Child Another one of the things we have heard a great deal about in recent years is the inner child. I believe that every healthy adult ought to have a child within. By that I mean that each individual should be responsible, yet light-hearted. Growing up too fast. And he called a little child to himself, and put him in the midst of them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you repent change, turn about and become like little children trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Matthew 18 2, 3 Do you feel in your childhood you were forced to grow up too fast? If so, you should know that happens to a lot of people. When it does, they lose something, and that loss is detrimental to their adulthood. As adults we should be able to accomplish things in our lives without feeling burdened. We should be responsible, and yet light-hearted enough to enjoy our daily lives, even our work, as we read in Ecclesiastes 5, 18 Behold, what I have seen to be good, and fitting is for one to eat and drink, and to find enjoyment in all the labor in which he labors under the sun all the days which God gives him for this is his allotted part. In fact, I believe we should be able to enjoy every single thing we do. Some years ago this fact was brought to my attention, because I realized I was past 40 years of age, married with four children, and yet I could not say I had ever really enjoyed very much of my life. John 10, 10 tells us Jesus said he came to this earth so that you, and I might have life and enjoy it to the full. Some time ago, I did a series titled The Lost Art of Enjoying Life then recently wrote a book on the subject, enjoying where you are on the way to where you are going. I really think we have forgotten how to enjoy life. We need to learn how to be childlike, because if there is one thing a child knows how to do it is enjoy anything and everything. But when a child is forced to grow up too quickly without being permitted to act out his childhood, the result is often tremendous emotional problems. I believe people today force their children to grow up too fast. The parents are so anxious for their children to learn to read, write, and get a head start on life, they don't allow them just to be kids. Somewhere we have arrived at the mistaken idea, that the more we can cram into a child's mind, the smarter and more happy and successful he will be in school and in life. Now I'm not against educating children. Youngsters should be encouraged to learn quickly and easily, and to excel in their studies but they should not be forced to take on responsibilities beyond their years. They need an opportunity to just be themselves and enjoy life before taking on the heavy burdens of adulthood. In my own case, I hated childhood. I desperately wanted to grow up so that no one could ever push me around or mistreat me. Whatever childhood was supposed to be, it was stolen from me. What I had as a replacement I did not like or want so I grew up knowing nothing about being childlike. My memories of being a child were very painful to me. That what abuse does it robs a person of his childhood. The same thing happens when a child is saddled with responsibility too heavy for him to bear at his age. He may have to take care of a sick parent or fill the place of a missing mother or a father in the family. He may be forced to go to work outside the home sooner than he should. I started working at about age 13. I lied about my age, saying I was 16. I did it because I needed to take care of myself to earn my own money so that I wouldn't have to ask anyone for anything. I was determined that nobody was going to give me anything for nothing because I didn't want to feel obligated to anyone. I had a worker personality and still do. The natural worker in me plus the abuse I suffered turned me into a workaholic. I felt comfortable, happy, and fulfilled only when I was working and accomplishing something. I didn't know how to relax and enjoy anything. If I had work to do, I was never able to quit until it was finished. I had not yet learned that work is never really finished. There is always something that needs to be done. Now I have learned to work until quitting time then leave whatever I'm doing for the next day. If you and I don't do that, we open ourselves up to burn out. And once we get burned out, it is very hard to recover. Not being permitted to play will steal a person's childhood and his enjoyment of adulthood. For some reason I was made to feel guilty on those rare occasions in childhood when I did play. I always had the feeling I shouldn't be doing it, that I ought to be hard at work. 
that feeling damaged me. It took me years to get to the point of not feeling guilty if I was having a good time. One night a few years ago, my son asked me to stop working and come sit down and watch a movie with him on television. I wanted to do that. I wanted to pop some popcorn, open up a couple of sodas, and sit down to enjoy a movie with my son. But I had such a nagging sense of guilt I couldn't enjoy it. Finally I said to myself, what's my problem? There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I need to spend time with my children like this. The movie is clean, the popcorn is low fat, and the soda is diet. Why do I feel so guilty? The Lord said to me, Joyce, you didn't do everything today you thought you should do. And you didn't do everything today the way you think you should have done it. Therefore you feel like you don't deserve to have any fun. My problem was thinking I had to deserve every bit of fun, enjoyment, or blessing that came my way. I needed to learn about God's free gift, His grace and favor. The good things that come to us in this life are given to us by the Lord. See James 1, 17. He wants to give them to us. He wants us to enjoy life to the fullest, even when we don't entirely deserve it. We need to be delivered from our guilt complex, from thinking we have to deserve God's gifts to us. We think we have to earn everything, but God wants us to know we only have to receive and enjoy them in thanksgiving and gratitude. If we are not enjoying life as we should, the reason is that the devil is trying to steal our joy. One way he does that is by destroying the child in each of us. Satan is out to destroy the child. And the dragon stationed himself in front of the woman who was about to be delivered, so that he might devour her child, as soon as she brought it forth. And she brought forth a male child, one who was destined to shepherd rule all the nations with an iron staff scepter, and her child was caught up to God, and to his throne. And the woman herself fled into the desert wilderness, where she has a retreat prepared for her by God, in which she is to be fed and kept safe. Revelation 12:4-6. When I began to do a scripture study of this subject, I saw that Satan is always out to destroy the child. And God is always trying to protect the child. This principle applies not only to actual children, and to the promised Christ child, but also to the inner child in each one of us. Unless we have a healthy child within us, we cannot play and enjoy life the way God intends. My husband is a wonderful man, a mighty man of valor. Yet he has a big kid in him. He has always been able to have fun and enjoy everything he does. I used to want to be that way. But I wasn't willing to just cut loose, let go, and enjoy myself. Dave has always been good about going to the grocery store with me. We would go only every two weeks or so, and because we had a certain, limited amount of money to spend, I had to shop very wisely and carefully. There I would be with my grocery list, coupons, calculator, my three kids, and my husband, really intense about getting the best deal on everything. The truth is, at that time in my life I was pretty intense about everything. But where I was too intense, too adult in my attitude and behavior, Dave was just the opposite. He had all the characteristics of a child. He could even have fun in the grocery store. Characteristics of a child. And a little child shall lead them. Isaiah 11, 6. When studying this material, I wrote down two or three pages of notes about the characteristics of a child. One of them is that a child has fun, no matter what he does. Regardless of what a child does, he can manage to find a way to have a good time. He can be punished, and made to stand in a corner, and he will make a game out of it, by doing something like counting the flowers on the wallpaper. When my son was younger, I asked him to sweep off the patio, so he took a broom and went outside. Since he really didn't want to do that job, he grumbled a little bit. But a few minutes later I looked out, and saw him dancing with the broom. He was sweeping all right, but he was having a good time, while he was doing it, that's where you and I fail as adults. We have all kinds of mundane things to do, things we hate and dread and just want to get over with, but we don't allow ourselves to enjoy them. Included in this list are religious duties, things we think we are supposed to do to be good Christians. If we approach them as obligations, they become chores rather than privileges. God wants us to learn how to enjoy these things and to enjoy Him. 
He wants us to enjoy prayer, Bible study, and going to church, just as he wants us to enjoy our spouse, children, family, home, and everything else in life. He wants us to enjoy cleaning house, washing the car, mowing the lawn and all those other things that we do, while thinking to ourselves, boy, I'll be glad when this is over, so I can do something fun. For too long we have put off enjoying life. God wants us to enjoy everything even going to the grocery store. Having fun. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be glad and to get, and to good, as long as they live, and also that every man should eat, and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor it is the gift of God. Ecclesiastes 3 12, 13. So Dave would go to the grocery store with me to have fun. He would chase the kids up, and down the aisles with the shopping cart. Since I was so concerned about appearance and reputation, I would try to get him to stop. Will you quit making a scene? I would say. Everybody's looking at us. Then he would answer, if you don't be quiet, I'll chase you with the cart. Then he would start after me, and I would really get upset. But even then, he wouldn't let me make him mad. Instead he would think up some other way, to amuse himself and the kids. Since he is six feet, five inches tall, he can see over the aisles I can't. He would see me in the next tile all intense with my coupons, calculator, and card and throw something over the top of the aisle aiming at the card. One time I got so upset with him I yelled, would you please stop it? You're driving me nuts. Oh, for crying out loud, Joyce, he said. I'm just trying to have a little fun. Well, I didn't come here to have fun, I answered honestly. I came to get groceries. I want to get them off the shelf, put them in the cart, take them to the checkout stand, haul them out to the trunk of the car, take them home, and put them in the cupboard. I had my plan all laid out. But in that plan I had not allowed for any fun. Live a little. A happy heart is good medicine and a cheerful mind works healing, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Proverbs 17, 22 wouldn't it be wonderful if we all got around to doing a little living while we're going through this life doing all the things we think we are supposed to do? Because my childhood had been stolen from me, I never learned to be childlike. I never learned to lighten up and live a little. I was always uptight about everything. But Dave was the type who enjoyed life regardless of what was going on around him. Although I may never have the ability to be like him, because of the differences in our personalities, I have learned I can be much happier and more light-hearted than I was. As a minister of the gospel, I have a huge responsibility. I have to work hard at what I have been called to do, and I love it. I really do enjoy my work. But if I'm not careful, I can become stressed and burned out. That's why I have to make an effort to apply verses like Proverbs 17, 22, and develop a happy heart and a cheerful mind. If you and I are not emotionally balanced, our entire lives will be affected. I truly believe, if we don't learn to laugh more, we are going to get into serious trouble. Because, as the Bible teaches, laughter is like medicine. There have been many articles written in recent years stating that medical science now confirms laughter can't be instrumental in bringing healing to the body. Laughter is like internal jogging in many ways as good as physical exercise. We all need to laugh more. But sometimes we have to do it on purpose. We have seen how children enjoy life, how they make a game of everything. Another thing they do is giggle all the time. I have seen this in my grandchildren. As they run and play throughout the house, everything they do is punctuated by giggles. Now I realize that as adults we are not supposed to go through life giggling like children. If we did, we might get fired from our job, or, even worse, get sent to a mental facility for examination. The point I'm making is, if we get too serious, we can cause damage to ourselves and to those with whom we come in contact. We need a balance of fun and responsibility. In my own life, I was so serious I thought I couldn't or shouldn't have anything to do with anything I considered frivolous. It was very hard to get me to laugh at anything. But for a child, it doesn't take very much at all. To him, everything is funny. We need to find more humor in our everyday lives. 
and one of the first things we need to learn to laugh at is ourselves. Instead of getting all upset at our human mistakes and shortcomings, we need to learn to laugh at our failures and foibles. There is nothing funnier than human beings. As Art Linkletter used to say on his old radio and television shows, people are funny. And that includes us. We need to recognize that fact and become more attuned to the playful child within each of us. God gave us a child. When they saw the star, they were thrilled with ecstatic joy. And on going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasure bags, they presented to him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. And receiving an answer to their asking, they were divinely instructed and warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, so they departed to their own country by a different way. Now after they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up! Tenderly take unto you the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there till I tell you otherwise, for Herod intends to search for the child, in order to destroy him. Matthew 2.10-13 We recognize this passage as part of the Christmas story. The child spoken of here is baby Jesus, and those who came and fell down and worshipped him, presenting him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, are, of course, the wise men. I'm recalling this story because I want to emphasize the point that when God looked down from heaven and saw our lost condition, his answer was to send us a child, as we read in Isaiah 9, 6 4 to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. The Father sent us a child to deliver us, and right away King Herod set out to destroy that child. In the same way, God has given each of us an inner child, and the enemy has set out to destroy that child within us. The devil is after our childlikeness. He does not want us to be free like little children. Children are free. We have considered some of the characteristics of a child. One of the most important of these traits is that children are free. They are not concerned with what people think. Some time ago I watched two young children during a church service. The little boy had brought his toy microphone with him. He was all dressed up in his Sunday suit, and during the praise and worship part of the service, he was singing into that toy microphone, holding it up, and turning this way and that, just like he was performing in front of a huge audience. The mother of the little girl had obviously let her come to church directly from dance class, because she was still wearing her ballet costume. While the little boy was singing enthusiastically into his microphone, she was dancing around like a ballerina. They were thoroughly enjoying themselves, and they didn't care what anybody thought about it. They were not yet old enough to have come under the bondage of, what will people think? Sometimes it takes a great step of faith to overcome our inhibitions, and give free expression to our pent-up emotions, regardless of the opinion of others. That's when we need to exhibit, and enjoy the freedom of a child. Avoiding Phariseeism. Then were our mouths filled with laughter, and our tongues with singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Psalm 126-2-3 I was watching a Christian television talk show in which the participants were talking about the laughing revival that is sweeping the land. Someone asked the host of the show if he thought it was of God. Does it offend your mind, the host asked. Yes, it does, answered the person who had raised the question. Well, then, responded the host, it's probably of God. I don't know if you ever noticed it or not, but Jesus went around offending people all the time. It sometimes seems he did it on purpose. In Matthew 15, 12 we read, Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were displeased and offended and indignant when they heard this saying? Jesus answered to them was let them alone and disregard them, they are blind guides and teachers. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a ditch v 14. Jesus knew exactly how to get to the self-righteous Pharisees. We must be on our guard against Phariseeism. If the truth were known, the church today is full of Pharisees. I used to be one of them. In fact, I was a chief Pharisee. I was rigid, legalistic, 
boring, out to impress others, humorless, critical, judgmental, and on and on. I was on my way to heaven, but I wasn't enjoying the trip. You and I need to get out of our straight jackets. Jesus was not sent into this world to bind us up, but to set us free. We need to be free to express our thanksgiving and praise to him for all the great things he has done, is doing, and is going to do for us. Now I don't mean by that statement we are to go through life trying to see how ridiculous we can act from daylight to dark. I'm not talking about weirdness and fanaticism, I'm talking about freedom and joy. I'm talking about being liberated from the shackles of pharisaical religion, so that we can freely follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Protect and preserve the inner child. And having risen, he took the child and his mother by night, and withdrew to Egypt, and remained there until Herod's death. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been misled by the wise men, was furiously enraged, and he sent and put to death all the male children in Bethlehem, and in all that territory who were two years old and under, reckoning according to the date which he had investigated diligently, and had learned exactly from the wise men. Matthew 2 14-16 Again we see illustrated in this story, how the devil seeks after the child in each of us to destroy it. That's why we must be vigilant not to allow him to destroy that inner child the Lord has placed within us to keep us from giving into, and being controlled by our pharisaical nature. Becoming, receiving, accepting, and welcoming a little child. Whoever will humble himself therefore, and become like this little child trusting, lowly, loving, forgiving is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives and accepts, and welcomes one little child like this for my sake, and in my name, receives and accepts and welcomes me. Matthew 18 4, 5 You and I must humble ourselves, and become as little children. We must also learn to receive, accept, and welcome the child within us. But some of us have a hard time doing that, because we are striving so hard to become spiritually mature. In one place in the Bible, we are told to grow up into Christ Ephesians 4, 15, and here we are told by Jesus, to become like a little child. The truth is, that we are to do both. The Lord wants us to grow up in our attitude, behavior, and acceptance of responsibility. At the same time He wants us to be childlike in our dependence upon Him, and in our free expression of our feelings toward Him. A good example is found in Matthew 19, 14 in which we read what happened when Jesus' disciples tried to keep children from coming to him, he said, leave the children alone. Allow the little ones to come to me, and do not forbid or restrain or hinder them, for of such as these is the kingdom of heaven composed. Leave the children alone. Isn't that a wonderful statement? Just as Jesus received, accepted, and welcomed the little children who came to him, so we must receive, accept, and welcome the little child God has placed within each of us. Children need to feel safe and secure and cared for. They need to be able to express their feelings and emotions fully and freely. So do we. Unstop the wells, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 4 13, 14 KJV In his conversation with the woman at the well, Jesus said those of us who believe in him will have within us a well of water springing up continually. But if that well gets stopped up, then we have a problem. Because the water within us cannot flow, it becomes stagnant. If your life is stale and polluted, it may be because your well of living water has been filled up with stones by the enemy, as was done in Old Testament days. In 2 Kings 3, 19 the Lord told the Israelites who were being attacked by the Moabites you shall smite every fenced city, and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. In those days, stopping up wells with stones, was one of the weapons used to defeat one's enemies. Our enemy, the devil, still uses that weapon against us today. I believe that you and I are born with a nice, clean flowing well within us. As children, we still have that well flowing freely. 
but through time our enemy, Satan, comes along and starts throwing stones into that wall stones of abuse, hurt, rejection, abandonment, misunderstanding, bitterness, rejection, resentment, self-pity, revenge, depression, hopelessness, and on and on. By the time we have become adults, our wells are so filled with stones that they have become stopped up and no longer flow freely within us. Every now and then we may feel a little gurgle down inside. But we never seem to experience the full release that is needed for our wells of water to flow freely once again. It is interesting that when Jesus went to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead, he ordered, Take away the stone John 11:39. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to take away the stones that have been clogging our wells of living water. When alcoholics and drug addicts speak of getting drunk or high on drugs, they call it getting stoned. With us it is just the opposite. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we get unstoned so that our lives can overflow with living water. Living water. Now on the final and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood, and he cried in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me who cleaves to and trusts in, and relies on me as the scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. But he was speaking here of the Spirit, whom those who believed trusted, had faith in him were afterward to receive. For the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified raised to honor. John 737-39 Notice in this passage Jesus did not say that from those who believe in him there will flow rivers of living water once in a while. He said these rivers of living water will flow continuously. That living water is the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was talking about here is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior have received the person and the power of the Holy Spirit in us. The river of living water flows within you and me. It is not supposed to be stopped up, but it is to bubble up within us and flow out of us. And we can release the power of that living water in an even greater measure by receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Please write to my ministry at the address in the back of the book to obtain more information about this experience. What we have to learn to do is to go with the flow. Go with the flow. Go with the flow has a double meaning for me because of an incident which I describe in great detail in another of my books. When my children were small, several times a week, it seemed, one of them would spill a glass of milk at the dinner table. Each time I would immediately fly into a rage and into action to clean up the spill because the milk would run all over the table, down into the crack in the table where the leaf was inserted and down the table legs. One day while I was under the table during dinner on all fours in a raging tantrum sopping up the mess, the Holy Spirit ministered to me that all the fits in the world would not cause the milk to run up the table legs and back into the glass. Because my children were small, they were going to spill things. The Holy Spirit taught me just to go with the flow. From that experience I learned to laugh at things that used to upset me. When things go wrong in our lives, Dave and I have learned to say, I'm not impressed, Satan, you're not impressing me at all. I have figured out that if we don't let the devil impress us, then he can't oppress us. Here is another instance in which we have got to learn to use the weapon of laughter against the enemy. The Laugh of Faith the wicked plot against the uncompromisingly righteous, the upright and right standing with God, they gnash at them with their teeth. The Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that their own day of defeat is coming. Psalm 37 12, 13. The Bible teaches that the Lord sits in heaven and laughs at his enemies, because he knows the day of their defeat is coming. That is what I call the laugh of faith. Do you remember Abraham's reaction in Genesis 17, 17? when God told him that his wife Sarah would bear a child in her old age and become a mother of nations. He laughed. Then in Genesis 18-12 when Sarah overheard the Lord repeating this promise to Abraham, she also laughed. So when the child of promise was born, Abraham and Sarah did as the Lord commanded and named him Isaac, meaning laughter. General 17, 19 Do you know what I believe that says to us? I believe it says that, if we will wait on the promises of God, and learn to be inheritors instead of laborers, we will end up laughing. We will be giving birth to Isaacs, not Ishmael's. 
Laughter unstops the wells. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. Genesis 26, 18. One of the things Isaac did, when he was grown, was to unstop the wells of his father Abraham which their enemies had stopped up. We can understand this to mean, that laughter and joy in the Holy Spirit, will unstop our wells. You and I don't have to labor over this issue, or become extremely philosophical about it. We just need to become like little children. Regardless of our age, if we are to enter the kingdom of God we need to become like little children, just as Jesus spoke of in Luke 18, 17. The kingdom of God is available to us at the moment of the new birth. But in order to enter into it, and enjoy it to the full, here and now, we must become like little children. It is interesting to note how many times the writers of the New Testament referred to the followers of Jesus as little children. For example, in 1 John 4, 4, we read, Little children, you are of God you belong to him, and have already defeated, and overcome them the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater mightier than he who is in the world. As I ponder on this verse and others like it, it seems to me, that the Lord is pretty intent on teaching us to develop and maintain a childlike mentality. In other words, he wants us to feel, and act like his little children. He wants us to have a childlike dependence on him, believing that, like any good father, he will take care of us, watch over us, and provide for us. He wants us to believe, that we can relax, and be free in him. If you have lost your inner child, then this is the time, to get that child back. Children are simple and uncomplicated. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 16 KJV Here again, we are told, that we are children, the children of God. If that is so, we need to know what children are like, so we will know how we are to conduct ourselves, and live our everyday lives. That's why we have been looking at what children are like throughout this chapter. The last of the characteristics of children we need to consider is their simplicity. By nature, children are simple and uncomplicated. They are also inquisitive in a healthy way, but they don't get involved in reasoning, because it causes too much confusion. They ask a lot of questions, but they don't get mentally and philosophically deep. As we have seen, John 10, 10 tells us Jesus said he came, that we might have life, and have it more abundantly. He also said the devil comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. One of the things he was referring to was the religious system of the day, that kept people in bondage, because it was not filled with life, joy, and freedom but only with rules and regulations and reasons. In John 9 when Jesus and his disciples sought a man who had been born blind, they wanted to know who had sinned to cause him to be blind the man, himself, or his parents vv1, 2. Asking that type of question is typical of us. That's the way we are we always try to figure out everything in our own lives and the lives of those around us. We want an answer for everything. Then when Jesus anointed the man's eyes, sent him to wash in the pool of Siloam, and the man came away seeing, the Pharisees called him in and questioned him. They wanted to know who had healed him, and how he had done it vv6234. Spiritual manifestations and demonstrations are things we humans cannot understand. We don't have to know how Jesus heals, in order to be healed, or to be instruments of his healing for others. We can be like the man who was healed of his blindness by Jesus. We can say, in childlike simplicity and trust, I don't know how he did it, all I know, is that I was blind and now I see, v25. We always want to get, so theologically deep about everything. But when we start trying to explain God, we get into all kinds of problems. Children don't try to figure out or explain everything. They just accept things as they are and enjoy them. They are not double-minded. They make up their mind, what they want and go after it without being bothered by what others think or say. Children are persistent. They stick to their dreams and goals longer than adults, because they know what they want, and are not afraid to go for it. As a result, they don't get as discouraged or depressed as adults do. Children are not afraid of emotions, or of showing them. What they feel on the inside is written all over their faces. If they are happy, excited, or enthusiastic, it shows. 
we can let children be an example to us in this way. If we are happy in the Lord, we can and should show it to the whole world as a witness to them. Become like a little child. Stop worrying, fretting, and getting all frustrated and upset trying to figure and reason everything out. Learn to relax and take it easy. Make a decision to enjoy the rest of your life. No matter what your situation or circumstances, regardless of your past experiences or future prospects, determine to find a way to bring a little laughter and fun into your life. If you want to be emotionally whole, find and restore the lost child within you. Conclusion In this book we have looked at how to manage our emotions so that we can enjoy and use them in the way God intended. God gave us emotions to enjoy the abundant life he wants to give us and to be moved in compassion to minister to others for him. Until we learn to manage them, our emotions can't be our greatest enemy because Satan will try to use them to keep us from walking in the spirit. No matter what has happened to you in the past, God can heal you so that you can look at the world through his eyes and enjoy what he has given and is giving you. The rewards of managing your emotions are great. Apply what you have read in this book and learn to enjoy everything you do. If you like this channel, subscribe to our channel. Help us to keep growing. Thank you very much.